What's up, guys? This is Coach Donnie with ElevateYourself.org. Welcome to another episode of The Dig, where we talk about everything from volleyball, training, and life, and dig deeper behind the athlete. And today, we have a special guest, the amazing Eric Shoji, uh, one of the best liberos in the world, and he's currently the libero for the USA men's national team. He's also a 2016 Olympic bronze medalist and an NCAA champion in 2012. Uh, he also has a great YouTube channel he just started where he does a series of reaction videos and professional volleyball analysis, which is there's not a lot of content out there. So if you guys wanna know that pro perspective, I'll leave the link for his channel in the description box, which you guys can check out. So before we get started, let's do a volleyball warm-up exercise um, called the quick set. So it's just gonna be a series of 10 questions and stream of consciousness, uh, whatever comes to mind. All right, you ready, Eric? Got it, I'm ready, let's do it. All right, favorite song? Uh, oh God, oh, oh God, oh God. <laughs> um, landslide, Stevie Nicks. Favorite food? Sushi. Favorite music? Oh God, um, pop-ish. Amazing serve, receive, pass, or amazing dig? Diving, serve, receive, pass into the seam um, that creates a middle blocker attack. Awesome. Favorite non-libero position? Setter. The go your go-to snack? <laughs> um, acai bowl, maybe just like chips if I'm having an off day. Favorite non-volleyball sport? Tennis, grew up playing it. Favorite movie? Ooh, favorite movie. What do I watch over and over again? I don't think, I, I, uh, can't, what is my stream of consciousness? What do I want to blurt out? What do I want to blurt out? <laughs> um, honestly, I don't have one. This is horrible. That's okay. That's part um, of the consciousness. Yeah. I, I, yeah, laugh. ask me again later. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> uh, favorite volleyball to play with? Ooh, are we sponsored by anyone here? USA Volleyball is sponsored by Molten. So Molten. Perfect. Dustin Watt had the same answer. I see it on your shelf too. Yes, I love Molten. Um, favorite volleyball player? Um, Kavika Shoji slash Michael Christensen slash Taylor Sander. Ah, I love that. Very cool. <laughs> Congratulations. You made it through. Good warm up. Oh, God. Nine out. I mean, movies. I, I, I seriously, I don't watch a lot of movies. So yeah. um, I apologize for that one. I That's still okay. can't think of one. That's okay. You probably, I mean, <laughs> you probably don't even have time. I mean, you're, you're either studying film, you know, practicing volleyball, playing games. So. You have a good reason not yeah, to watch movies. Yeah, I'm more of a TV show guy, and okay. um, movies. I don't. I, I. I'm still stumped. I'm still stumped. So, you know what? I'm. I'm glad you mentioned that because for all the future people I'm going to interview, I'm going to put favorite movie slash TV show. Because you're right, we're in the the era of TV shows. So why don't you give us your favorite TV show? Ooh, what have I been watching recently? Ozark slash walking dead it's on season 10 and i'm still watching that dexter and ooh, survivor okay. survivor 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 survivors number one and then the rest can be whatever they want okay perfect there you go all right so if you can just tell us a little bit about yourself like where you're from and what it was like growing up and so on yeah well i'm eric shoji you already said that um, I'm from Honolulu, Hawaii. I grew up, grew up there. I was born and raised. Uh, went to Punahou High School, class of 2008. And from there, I went to Stanford University, graduated in 2012, and joined the national team in 2013. Became a starting libero, was fortunate enough to get that job, and have been playing professionally ever since. I'm in my ninth professional season, my fourth in Russia, and currently um in my apartment in russia just on the season grind right now that's awesome and how did you start playing volleyball well my dad was the coach at the university of hawaii for the women's team for 42 years so 
I was basically born in the gym. I was raised in a gym. I was always there at practices, at games. I went on a ton of road trips. So I was always surrounded by the game. And I had a very big passion for volleyball from a young age. So I started young. I probably started competitive, competitively when I was eight and just grew from there. So I got started in my dad's gym and the rest is history, I guess. So speaking of your, your dad, the legendary Dave showed you, by the way, um, if you guys want to follow, and uh, I actually have his book about the Rainbow Wahine. Oh. Um, I actually bought it in. When my wife and I, we go to uh, Honolulu every, every year for our anniversary. Um, that's, that's our honeymoon amazing. trip. Um, I remember when I saw that at the local Walmart. I mean, that's how big volleyball oh, is there. I'm like, holy cow, they're selling this book at Walmart. This, this guy is definitely legendary status. Uh, but yeah, awesome. he was that's awesome. at U of H. So what was it like growing up with a volleyball coach as your dad? Well, I mean, he was the coach for the team, right? But he was also my coach in club. <laughs> and just growing up, probably since I was seven or eight, like I said, all the way until I was 18. So it was good. I mean, for us, it was normal. I think a lot of people think it's so weird to have your a coach as a dad or a dad as a coach. And for me, it was just normal to be around that atmosphere. We're in a super sports family, super competitive family. So you know, my dad was tough on us. He drilled us a lot. We had a lot of practice, a lot of reps. But at the end of the day, you know, I thank him for all that training because I think without it, I don't think I would be here today. So, you know, it was good. There were some tough times, obviously, but I think for the most part, it was a great experience. That's great. And we do have some volleyball parents listening in. How would you give some advice to someone that is coaching their kid or does want their kid to play the sport they love? Because there's always that risk of pushing them away or creating that divide. So coming from the other side, you know, what's your advice to the volleyball parents? Well, this might sound a little corny, but I think my parents, both of my parents, especially uh, my dad on the volleyball side, really emphasized attitude and effort. They're two of the controllables in our life and on the volleyball court. And, you know, he's someone that obviously knew there's going to be good days and bad days. He saw it from his own team. He saw it from our team. But as long as we put the, the good work in, we had a positive attitude and we were great teammates, then we got mostly positive feedback. I think we never really got screamed at too often unless, you know, we didn't, we didn't put in the work or we didn't try in a game or we didn't, um, we weren't nice to our teammates. So it was all about the attitude and the effort. I think it's important to distinguish when your kid is maybe not engaged and making mistakes or fully engaged and still making mistakes. I think everyone makes physical errors, but I think as parents, you need to recognize the physical versus the mental. And I think my dad really did well with that. That's excellent feedback. Um, even though you might have view it as corny, actually not enough people are saying that. Like being a volleyball coach, it is really about the things within your control and having a conversation with Reed Pretty on my last interview, he also emphasized the same thing where you know, I asked him, how do you have this incredible grind through four Olympics, going from non-meddling to being a gold medalist? I mean, all these amazing accomplishments. And he said he credits his parents a lot for praising his effort more so than the result of his performance. And, and it's more than just like a, a movie-like experience of like, oh, good job, son. Yeah. It really is the most successful lesson you can learn in life because that's all we have control over. You got to look over the result and focus on the process. Absolutely. And it's something that we still talk about on the national team today. So we're not a big team about, you know, getting on each other or yelling at each other. We just think it's, it's not, it's not the right culture for the people that we have. But, you know, if I shank a 90 mile an hour serve, 80 mile an hour, we'll say, uh, versus not covering a ball because I'm not ready. It's two different kinds of mistakes. And I think that our team is really good at recognizing that one was purely physical. I was 100% engaged. The serve was just better than my reception on that point. And the other mistake was completely a mental mistake. I wasn't ready. And it was more about my, my effort in that play. Yeah. And that's awesome that the USA culture is like that, both on the men's and women's side. And hopefully that will kind of create this trickle effect for all of our youth coaches to create that culture all the way down there. And I'm sure you'll have a lot of opportunities to talk about Fakil, uh, your Russian team. But I'm just curious for myself before I forget to ask the question, 
the from what I know as like the stereotypical Russian volleyball culture is a lot of negative reinforcement, a lot of yelling and getting on you. Is that has that been your experience with playing in Russia for four years? You know, I feel like I've been pretty lucky. I think that there's a little bit of that, especially amongst the Russians. It's just honestly how they're raised. It's how they've grown up in the gym. It's how they respond. You can see guys get pissed and angry at each other, but they play so much better like that sometimes. Yeah. Um, I actually have an Italian coach mm. who is not exactly like that. I've actually never had a Russian head coach in my four years here. So I haven't had the full experience, I guess, but there's definitely a tendency to be a little bit more upfront, a little bit more negative towards mistakes. Um, but on my team, fortunately, it's, it's changing. The, the culture is changing. It, it's not that. It's probably a mixture of, you know, USA and, you know, old school Russian culture. But yeah, I, I feel like it's a really good balance at this point. That's really great to hear. And, you know, not surprising from a country that values uh, exercise science and sports psychology because they, they, were, they were pioneers in those fields. And I also saw this trend with Lan Ping from the USA women's team. She mm -hmm. really brought in this new ideology uh, to update kind of our, our coaching methodology and, and was the opposite of what traditional Chinese coaching, which is, you know, a lot of yelling. Culturally, that's acceptable, but to bring yeah. the team in the new era was a totally different approach. So, and they ended up winning a gold medal, which was awesome. So um, going back to your volleyball journey, um, how did you end up playing libero? And if you can be honest with us, was that your first positional choice? Ooh, well, I always grew up playing above my age group. So my brother's two years older and we just grew up playing on the same team. So that basically just meant that I was the smallest kid. <laughs> and from that, I probably, I remember in, in 14, but I was 12, I was playing libero. So I have practiced and played libero since I was 12 and I'm 31 now. So what is that, 19 years, um, which is pretty insane to think about. But I have also played almost every other position except middle blocker. In high school, I set and I hit and in club, I also set and hit. So for me, I knew it was the position that I was going to have to be moving forward, considering my size. And to be honest, I feel like I have a good personality for the position and I've grown to love it and just try to be as good as I can for my team. I think I've just accepted my role. <laughs> I've accepted this height. I've accepted my <laughs> athletic ability and just trying to be the best libero that I can be. Yeah. And to the listeners out there, don't be fooled. There's a video clip, which I'll, I'll put in the edit of uh, Eric bouncing the ball oh, and hitting lines. So uh, oh God. Don't, don't, don't put it past them. <laughs> well, <laughs> I will say I, I did love hitting and I love setting. Um, I, I like to hit in warm up. I, for me, it's just like a good warm up to do before yeah. games and just get some energy out. So I try to get some bounces in. Sometimes it's like hits the antenna back <laughs> in the face, but we're not going to put those ones on mine. Yeah, don't worry. I don't, there's no record of those in my book. Um, actually, I think you guys usually start off with you hitting. In, like that's the tradition of USA, right? When I've watched you guys play, you will get the first set. Yeah. So if I'm remembering this right, it's. Micah does some like dumb basketball thing to whoever the other setter is. I'm not sure what he does. <laughs> and then I might go or Matt might go, but it's, it's, it's definitely in that order. Okay. I'm definitely second or third. And hitters always complain to me, like, why are you hitting? And I say, I don't care what you think. <laughs> I'm going to hit because I want to warm up too. So yeah, it's, it, it's fun. It's all jokes. Ah, oh, that's awesome. So the barrels out there, uh, one coach told me that all the barrels are, uh, also hitters at heart so there is some some hitting in there that's good For so sure. how did you choose um stanford university coming out of one of the top high school boys volleyball programs in the nation i'm sure you were highly recruited um you know choosing stanford that was not highly ranked um volleyball wise school at the time yeah i mean we all know stanford it, great athletics great academics i mean i hope that we're gonna start talking about them eliminating 11 sports but we'll get there eventually um yeah i was recruited by a couple of schools i act stanford like slipped in 
pretty late. I just didn't know if I was going to get in and if I was just academically ready to push myself that much in school. I knew that I wanted to be a great volleyball player. I just didn't know if I wanted to be a good student and work that hard in the classroom. So once I kind of figured out, once I got in and was like, okay, I'm going to make this commitment. I, you know, it was a pretty easy choice. My brother was there. Um, he was a junior when I was a freshman. Some of my best friends in life were there in Spencer McLaughlin, Jordan Inafuku, Brad Lawson committed with me, who's also from Hawaii. So it was pretty easy to like transition to a team where I had played with all of these guys for years. And one thing that a lot of people don't know is that my sister actually worked at Stanford at the time for the women's mm-hmm. team. So it sounds like a pretty easy decision back then. It really wasn't. It felt like I was super stressed and like, this is such a hard decision, but at the end of the day, I made the right one. And obviously I'm glad that I went and experienced those four years there. Yeah. And actually in 2010, I, I just graduated from San Jose State a year prior to that and living in the Bay Area, going to school nice. in the Bay Area. I've, I witnessed that transformation. And for those that, that you guys don't know, um, international fans, Stanford University his, has a his, historical volleyball program. They went through a little bit of a slump, um, like kind of when, when Eric entered the program. And one of their, their famous coaches, Al Rodriguez, uh, who also – through mutual friends coached at Logan high school, which is a local school that I've worked with too. Um, you know, his mantra was, was it zero to hero. It was worst to first, worst to first, pretty much. worst to first. Yeah. Worst to first. So being one of the bottom teams in their conference and he prophesied that, look, this is the group we're going to do it. And just such prophetic words to winning the championship in 2010. So if you can give us some insight on, on like what that journey was like and, what Al meant to you in the program and and what that championship was like when you guys finally achieved it. Yeah, well, Al was such a a mentor and a big part of the program. He was, um, unfortunately, he passed away during that 2010 season, pretty much around the time that we had gained that number one ranking. And it was just this amazing moment for our program and also a, a horrible moment knowing that he was so sick and had passed away, but he really motivated us and pushed us to be the best because he, he saw it. He saw it years before we actually yeah. reached number one. And it was actually my brother's freshman year where they really, really struggled. They won three games. They were the worst in conference. And Al pushed that group, um, told them that they were going to get better. We're going to get some good recruits. We're going to get some better, some good players. And that group really led us, the senior class of 2010, to that final victory in Maples Pavilion on the Stanford University campus in a sold out crowd in that arena, which was incredible to play. I'm sure it was awesome to witness as well, but it was just an amazing moment for our program. And it was such an honor to represent Al on the court that night. Yeah. And, you know, in, in California, we are one of the bigger volleyball communities, but just in USA in general, there's just not a lot of volleyball support as I had to have a sold out, audience was was pretty unique in itself and tons of local support everywhere from like your rec mom that was playing in her 40 year old league came out to support it was really great to see so speaking about stanford sports if you can talk to us i've spoken (laughs) this a little bit before you know what's going on and and what can we do to to help the situation yeah so i think a lot of people in america know that Stanford recently cut 11 sports. I think it was mid COVID around June or July and Stanford men's volleyball happened to be one of those sports, which was absolutely devastating to hear. Um, Like you said, we're a pretty, we're a pretty good program. You know, we've won two titles. I think we've gotten second place three times. We've had numerous Olympians, numerous medals and men's and boys, boys volleyball is a growing sport in America, which is great to see and I don't uh Stanford unfortunately cut the sport citing financial reasons um currently there are so many people fighting for all 11 sports to come back right now so many high profile athletes so many donors all of these great people that can help are getting the word out giving some money and we're hoping that not only our program gets reinstated but all 11 sports. But if you do want to support Stanford men's volleyball, 
There is an Instagram page um, at Save Stanford MVB, I believe is the Instagram, and there's a link to a GoFundMe page. Anything helps. Um, it's not necessarily it's not necessarily about how much you give. It's about the amount of people that are giving that will really help open the university's eyes. So just want to say thank you guys. Um, it's been a really tough and interesting summer, as we all know, and we're hoping to get those sports back. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. And we'll leave, definitely leave those links in the description box for you. Um, even if you choose not thank to you. give, just sharing it will be a huge help to all your volleyball friends, parents, coaches. Um, you know, this, this team means a lot to USA Volleyball, but the local community, I mean, sold out crowd in a non-volleyball country, you know, that, that's really rare and not in Nebraska either. <laughs> that's always yeah. out there. <laughs> Seriously, yeah. <laughs> All right. So um, at what age did you decide that you wanted to be a professional volleyball player and what, what had to change in your life to pursue that goal? Ooh. That's a great question. Like I said, my brother was two years older than I was, and he actually went overseas two years before I did, after he graduated from Stanford in 2010. So him being overseas kind of opened my eyes up to what professional volleyball was. I think back in 2012, it doesn't seem that long ago, but the, the access to professional volleyball just wasn't that great. I don't, there wasn't anything on YouTube. There weren't a lot of articles being written. There weren't a lot of updates. We knew of professional players, but it might have been on paid TV, like once a summer that the USA team was on, on television. So we just didn't really know what it was and what it meant to, be, to go overseas and be a professional volleyball player. So I'm lucky that Kavika went over before I did and kind of explained everything and also gained a pretty good reputation in Germany, which is where I actually ended up getting my first contract. So I probably decided I wanted to be a pro, I would say heading into my senior year of college. So pretty late, I just, I just didn't know. There wasn't a lot of knowledge out there about being a professional. And I think what needed to change was my ability to be on my own. I think I've just always been surrounded by friends and family and a great support system and thank God for technology because I'm still able to have that in my life but yeah. just being able to live and cook and drive and meet new people and go out for lunch with foreigners who don't speak my language was totally not me back in 2012 so that needed to change and I'm so glad that I went because I've just had so many great experiences in the past nine years <laughs> yeah yeah and if you can share with us uh, what countries you played in, what leagues, and then how you ended up in Russia, because that's, a, that's a, a small change from Hawaii. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it might have been snowing today here. <laughs> it definitely was snowing here. Um, let's see. I will just, I'll count the years. I was in Germany, Austria, Germany, Germany, Russia, Italy, Russia, Russia, Russia. So that is four countries. I think I've been on five teams I think it is um I can't remember how I ended up in Russia was pretty lucky actually it was after the Rio Olympics in 2016 I actually didn't have a contract I was struggling to find a deal I was kind of like all right I'm gonna be home I'm gonna take this time to be with family and friends and train in the USA gym um then my brother's team in Russia at the time actually they they wanted another libero and I was, I guess, the best one on the market maybe. So again, following Kavika, but I was able to get that contract and um, play well enough where some other Russian teams were interested. And I ended up on this team now for the last three years. That's awesome. And for those who aren't as well versed in professional volleyball, it's really, really hard to get a contract as a libero let alone on a top team in the world in one of the top leagues in the world you know most teams they just want to hire a gun like an opposite maybe one middle who can just serve bombs and or one outside hitter but a lot of pro teams feel like they can find a good domestic libero and the fact that the team values passing enough to hire some you know a top tier libero which is really great uh so that's that's really great to see and um thank you thank you and to see, you know, your, your work and your effort being rewarded because 
you can grind the same way as an outside hitter or an opposite, but then not get the same recognition. Um, so who, who are some of your role models in the libero world that you aspired to be like, you know, younger and, and who do you model yourself after? Ooh, great question. I mean, I, I already explained, I grew up around Hawaii volleyball. So there are some great liberos that played for my dad's team. Um, gosh, I'm going to name some old school, but Melani Yamashita, she was more in the nineties. Melissa Villa Roman was early two thousands when I really started to like, be a libero on the men's side there was Vernon Potluski who was an all-american there was Alfie Reft who was an all-american who I also played with on the national team um I also obviously knew of Eric uh Eric Sullivan and Rich Lamborn who were the previous USA uh, Olympic liberos before me so I've been lucky that I've had a lot of role models and all great people I know all of them and they're better people than they are volleyball players which is something that I always look for. I think that's so important. Volleyball only lasts for however many years. So yeah, I felt really lucky that I had a lot of role models and that my role models were student athletes because that's something that I really wanted to be growing up and um, great people, great volleyball players and great liberos. So I was really lucky to have that. That's awesome. And who is a, a current libero in the world that you feel inspired by or you feel like, I know it's kind of tough because you are one of those top three liberos, but who do you feel Thank inspired you. by or who do you Ooh. feel like you're competing with? Thanks for watching my interview with Eric Shoji. If you want to find out which liberos inspire Eric, what passing techniques he focuses on, and how the weight room has taken his game to another level, then sign up for my Patreon linked below. Not only will you get to watch the remaining 30 minutes of the interview and all future episodes, You'll also receive access to exclusive volleyball and training content like my private blog, live Q&A sessions, monthly podcasts, behind the scenes footage, and more. If you enjoyed watching The Dig, you can watch the first 11 episodes for free in the playlist link below. Let me know in the comments who you would like me to interview next and let's see if we can make it happen. Thanks again for watching and we'll see you in the next episode.